today in Rich in Relationship, we're going to talk about secret spending or hidden spending, undisclosed debt, misleading financial information, all the things that can lead to an emotional explosion in a relationship. But it is not unusual for people to be a little financially fuzzy even after they get married. Ultimately, any lack of transparency is going to lead to the erosion of trust. Welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And today we're talking about secret finances in relationships. Some people call this financial infidelity in relationships, but I'm not sure they're exactly the same thing. I think the broader topic is financial secrets. So let's understand, first of all, what is financial infidelity and how is that different than secrets? Financial infidelity occurs when one partner conceals financial activities or decisions from another, leading to a breach of trust. Now, I think the difference between infidelity and secrets is there may not be an agreement or an understanding about finances to begin with. So it might a secret might feel like infidelity, but it actually isn't because you haven't entered into, let's call it a covenant around money and spending yet, right? We, when we get married, we enter into a covenant about the relationship, but it is not unusual for people to be a little financially fuzzy even after they get married because most of us are not taught how to manage finances in high school, which we should be. Well, that's a whole other podcast. So what we're looking at here in this podcast are things like hidden spending, secret accounts and undisclosed debts, misleading financial information. But we're also going to be looking at what if there's just uh, unconscious or thoughtless spending going on that feels like a betrayal to the other person or to you. We're going to be looking at this whole ball of wax. How does it lead to fights? And what can we do about it? Right. More, most important is not just what's causal, but where where can we take it so that we can rebuild trust, so that we can rebuild honesty, so that we can rebuild safety, so that we can rebuild vulnerability and ultimately intimacy. Now, I want you to keep in mind that money is more than just something that we buy material goods with. We've done a lot of episodes on this so far. And so if you're not clear about this, scroll through some of the previous episodes on money and money fights that we've been doing this month. There's a lot in there about how much money can come to represent to each individual in the relationship. The point is that money re represents more than just a means of purchasing. What we're purchasing might represent something to us. But deep down, uh, what I found working particularly with people who are getting divorced is that money represents emotion to a lot of people. If one person in the relationship is feeling like they haven't been getting a level of support or care or love, whatever word you want to put on it, that they feel they should be getting from the other partner, it may show up for them as they're feeling like they need to take it in some way. And spending, spending unconsciously a lot of the times can show up that way or consciously. All right. Now that we've got a frame for this, money isn't just money. It can also represent emotion and it can drive a lot of this behavior. Uh, we've got an idea of where the, where the areas are that conflict might happen. Let's do the deep dive. All right. So what is hidden spending? It's making purchases in secret or disguising the true cost or purpose of the spending. Um, Going back to the divorce model, there are a lot of people who don't want their partner to know they're talking to a divorce lawyer because they're afraid of what it might trigger in the partner. It says, a lot, by the way, it says a lot about your relationship if you want to talk to a divorce lawyer, but your partner doesn't know that you want to, and you're afraid to let them know that you're looking at this as a possibility. Right? Just that says a lot about the the damage that's been done to honesty and communication in your relationship. Something's really off. But, and also, disguising 
spending or the nature of the spending can happen on a lot of different levels. Nowadays, we all have access to some detail of spending that's done. One partner might be going through the ACH payments, uh, you know, the, the debit card payments that an art, another partner's done. And maybe they notice that a lot of money was spent at ShopRite. And the partner who did the spending says, oh yeah, I just bought a lot of food. But they didn't just buy food. They bought seasonal, uh, like Valentine stuff. They bought uh, mugs, they bought whatever. Or a better example than ShopRite might be, wow, there's been a lot of spending at Costco. Uh, and they say, oh yeah, well, we, we always spend four or 500 bucks at Costco on groceries once a month, but really there was maybe the purchase of electronics uh, hidden in there, buried in there. There are, there are personal expenses, personal expenditures buried into the joint expenditures. Why is this a big deal? It might not be a big deal. But if you have an agreement with your partner that you're going to withdraw money from the joint account only for joint expenses, and that any personal expenses are going to come out of your personal account, and you're purchasing personal items with money from the joint account, this is a breach of trust right? It's a breach of agreement. Now, this agreement might be one that you have, or it might be one that you unconsciously think you should have and you haven't expressed. Either way, it's going to feel like a breach of trust. And the person who's doing it on some level knows that uh, maybe they're doing something that they should be more transparent about. Very much, very much like... Um, the example I started to give you of, you know, I feel like I'm not getting enough in this relationship, so I'm going to take it in some other way. And they might be doing it completely unconsciously. And when confronted, they might actually say, yeah, oh yeah, I bought myself a new camera to take pictures of the kids. And the other part of might say, what do you need a camera for? You've got a phone. Oh, well, uh, you know, uh, we really need better quality pictures. And why did you spend that money without talking to me? There might be a, the person who did the purchase might justify it, right? They might not even th think of how it appears to the other person. Undisclosed, secret accounts. If you have secret bank accounts that you're putting money into, and that also is not that unusual, then this can feel like a breach of trust. Maybe trust, maybe you have taken out a credit card without talking to your partner about it. Or maybe you have taken out a loan uh, you've borrowed money from somebody else without talking to your partner about it. And your your theory is, well, you know what? It's my loan. It's my credit card. But what you need to get is that in a marriage, both partners are on the hook for anything financially that one partner does. And so even if it's a small loan or a, or a low, um, like a few hundred dollar credit card, a low ceiling credit card, it's really important to talk to your partner about it. And doing these things in secret opens up the possibility for conflict. Undisclosed debt. Uh, I've had many clients who have a partner who has been accumulating debt and not talking about it with their other partner. And all of a sudden the other partner finds out and this explodes. Misleading financial information, providing false information about income or savings or financial obligations to avoid conflict or maintain control is also not uncommon. You know, it's not unusual for people to round their paycheck down, uh, especially if there's a, an agreement where both people are cashing their paycheck separately and feeding into a joint account. There, Or maybe somebody gets a raise and they don't tell their partner because they don't want to share that extra money for, for all the reasons that we've talked about. This happens because people might be afraid of conflict. You know, it might not be uh, just the reason that I was talking about before, that they feel like they should be getting more attention than they are. It might be that one partner is very sensitive and reacts. They go for, they have a lot of buttons around money and they go from zero to 60. And so the partner who's doing the hiding or the secret uh, accounts or the undisclosed debt or the misleading financial information might be really afraid of triggering the other partner. And so in order to keep the peace, they're unconsciously or even sometimes con consciously misleading them. It might be that they have different financial values. 
they, uh, they, they maybe they've just never come to agreement about how much money is going to be shared and how much money is kept separate and why. I have heard that it is not uncommon for Gen Xers to keep their finances completely separate, for example, which is kind of interesting because how do you pay for things that are jointly expensive? Uh, joint expenses then. I think some of them, uh, some people, uh, one person takes the the rent or mortgage, another person takes other expenses, and they cut it up that way. And at the same time, when people are married, if legally they're jointly held responsible on a number of levels, not on all levels, right? I want to be clear. It's not like when you get married, all your money is conjoined. Uh, some of that separate spending is actually considered joint spending. The beauty of separate spending is you don't run the risk of conjoined spending. That's a whole nother topic. But actually, let's not, it's not a whole nother topic. So what if one partner is getting money from their family and they don't want to share it? You know, legally, as long as they don't mix it, that's not considered a marital resource. But your partner may not agree. You might inherit a bunch of money. Uh, and that's actually your, par your partner is actually not legally entitled to it in many states, but your partner may feel they should be entitled to it. After all, they shared everything they had with you. It could be that not only is there a fear of conflict or different financial values, it might be that there's some power or control going on here. And I, we, I kind of intimated at that when we talked about one person goes from zero to 60. When one person's very sensitive about money, it's usually a control or a power issue. Ultimately, any lack of transparency is going, going to lead to the erosion of trust. So if what you're looking for is intimacy in a relationship, then lack of transparency is going to take away from intimacy, and that's going to move towards having more fights about money. 76% of all marriages have fights about money. So 76% of all marriages are have been moving away from intimacy and towards fighting. It is possible that the partner who feels betrayed feels deceived and they're angry, and they develop a long-term resentment towards the other partner. It might even be that they have a resentment, a family resentment that they've brought into the marriage that they are now transposing, projecting onto their partner. It may be that one partner has fear and insecurity. The, maybe they came out of a very abusive family, and it's not that their partner goes from zero to 60, but they're afraid they will because that's what they grew up with. And so their natural inclination is to hide and to have anxiety about this. It might be that partners come into the relationship with a certain amount of financial guilt and shame, or it might be that guilt and shame is present because unconsciously they know their behavior is not what they signed up for. And that guilt and shame is going to get in the way and lead to destructive conflict, lead to fighting, lead to I'm going to win, you're to the fight that we talk about here in Richard in Relationship, the I'm going to win, you're going to lose fight, the one where you lose even when you win because if your partner loses, the partnership is broken and you lose. Lack of transparency about finances on any level is going to cause relationship strain. Consciously violating an agreement that you have about money is a form of financial infidelity. It will be as damaging as flirting with someone or sharing intimate secrets with someone else. It might not be as damaging as actually having sex with someone else, though it really depends on your partner's values, to be honest. The breach of trust in finances, whether it's acknowledged or not, will have ripple effects in your family. If you come from a family where there's a lot of secret keeping, you think you may feel that's normal. You may think that's normal. You may feel like it's really important. I'm going to tell you that the impact of keeping secrets, anytime we withhold emotion, actions, thoughts, guilt, shame, any kind of negative feeling from our partner, they sense it on some level that we're hiding something. On some level, they may not recognize it consciously. They may choose to look the other way consciously, but unconsciously, they sense it. Unconsciously, they react to it. Unconsciously, the whole family reacts to it. Unconsciously, the message that we give our children is that secret keeping is okay and that it's all right 
to lie to people that we love about things that are important or things that maybe we've decided aren't important, but really are. This distinction between financial agreement and spending behavior is really important. Breaking a financial agreement is usually done consciously on some level, and it is incredibly damaging to the relationship. A more subtle destructive force is just unconscious spending. So in all the other, all the scenarios we've talked about so far, people are <clears throat> mostly consciously deciding to hide their raise, hide their debt, hide the, what they spent on, hide how they're spending it. But very often things are done, what, what? Unconsciously, meaning unthinkingly. Unconsciously means we're not really thinking, thinking about it. There isn't a thought. A, a, a decision is made, 80% of who we are is unconscious. A decision is just made automatically without much thought. And we don't really consider it. It's almost a form of self-deception when we don't acknowledge it. Um, so many of our decisions, however, are made on an unconscious level. And when you think about it, uh, the unconscious mind is what's responsible for our breathing, for our heart beating. When we're driving, the unconscious mind makes decisions about whether we're going to accelerate or brake unless the conscious mind inter intercedes and retrains it. The unconscious mind is going to make decisions about um, when we're walking upstairs, unless the conscious mind intercedes and interrupts that. And when we're doing those things, when we're driving, mostly the conscious mind is actually doing something else nine tenths of the time. So it is completely within the realm of possibility and actually happens that people spend money that might be a breach of an unconscious understanding of how money should be spent without really thinking about it. Um, let's go back to the case of buying the camera at Costco. You might have looked at the camera for a second and thought, this is something we really need. Oh, well, maybe I should pay this for my own money. You know what? I'm here now. I'm just going to take care of it. You know, I didn't bring my, I didn't bring my debit card. I'm just going to take care of it, right? So for a second there, you had the thought, oh, maybe I should have paid for it myself. Oh, I just need to get this done, right? It's a, that conscious decision, I just need to get this done is, uh, is based on an unconscious strategy that leads to it. And that unconscious strategy is disrespecting of whatever financial agreements you have unconsciously or consciously with your partner. And you don't really think about it until your partner looks at the Costco bills and goes, what? This is, a, this is like $500 here more than we usually spend. What's going on here? And then you go, wow, well, wait a minute. It's not a big deal. I didn't have my car, blah, 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 blah. And then you get into what? A whole big fight because you've got your position. I didn't have my card and I just spent it and I, didn't, I wasn't really thinking about it. And the other person says, why weren't you thinking about it? Don't you know how much things cost? Do you know how hard I have to work to make $500 that you spent on this camera? Da, 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 da. But it gets and turns into a big fight. So this unconscious spending probably drives, I'm going to say 80 or 90% of the fight since 80 or 90% of our decisions are on this level. Super important that we review our spending habits. All right. Get that um, the way we spend money is a pattern. It's a habit uh, and we can change it. We can change it by interceding with our conscious mind. Sometimes we have difficulty shifting the pattern, shifting the habit. And that's usually when we, you know, I get a lot of clients who come to me looking for help with exactly that. And we, I've talked about the mental and emotional release process, some breakthrough sessions before, you know, we work on shifting a major habit and usually inside of a, a habit that someone's really having trouble shifting, there's a limiting belief or some old emotions that, that reinforce that habit that need to be released along the way. They release it, we create a new strategy for moving forward, and we work on in, uh, acting that, living that strategy for the next six months together with success. So if you're having this kind of challenge around money, go for more information, go to richinrelationship.com. If you wanna get a free consultation with me, go to richinrelationship.com. Uh, and we have some free resources there on the website, so check it out. All right, so that we've talked about unconscious purchases. We've talked about secret spending. Let's, uh, does intent matter? Yes, it does. Um, I think there's a very firm distinction between when we vindictively, intentionally, or even just intentionally without being vindictive, decide to do something, and when we make a decision on automatic, right? And so some people would argue, well, you had a hidden intention there. Well, so let's make the distinction. Conscious intention versus hidden intention. You know, in in 
the uh, in uh, Hebraic law in the in the Torah in the Old Testament there was a there's a distinction made between killing someone with malice and doing it by accident right by it's like oops you know I accidentally dropped a brick on this guy's head and killed him versus I hate that sob I'm, and I threw a brick at him so there the reason why this distinction is made and by the way if you accidentally kill someone you could go get refuge in there were cities that were desig designated for refuge for people who accidentally killed someone. You could go seek refuge in those cities so that the family of the person that you killed could not go into that city and put a cap in your ass, basically, right? Uh, and there were limits to how long a, a, a gripe could be held, et cetera, et cetera. But it was a really important distinction. And let's hold that t distinction here too. Since 80 or 90% of what's going on is unconscious, it's not malicious but it's often interpreted as malicious. And so it's really important to understand where am I, where was I coming from when I did that and to lay it at the feet of your partner in this way. If it's consciously malicious, you want to own that and you want to explain the why of it. You know what? I consciously spend money uh, I, on that camera at Costco because I feel like you have been spending the lion's share of the money on your clubs and your night out with the, your friends, boys, girls, whatever. Um, and I never get a chance to spend money on anything. So I did it on purpose and I own it. And you know what? It was wrong the way I did it, but I want to talk about this bigger issue, right? Instead of going, you did this, so I did that. So it's right. You say, I mean, what I did was, I, I get it. What I did was a breach of our agreement, but I want to talk about the bigger issue of, you know, how you spend money and how I spend money, right? It's one thing to own the maliciousness and jump into it um, in a triggered way. And it's another thing to own it without being triggered, without having baggage, right? Without emo having emotional baggage and be willing to explore the bigger problem. This is kind of where we want to live with it. And if it's unconscious, then you have, you kind of have a get out of jail. It's not a get out of jail free. You get to go to, you get to go to one of those protected cities, a city of refuge. Your, your refuge is, yeah, you know what? I bought that camera without really thinking about it. And you're right. I should have thought about it more. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about that because I don't want to make that mistake again, right? There's less guilt in that action or actually, yeah, there may be less shame, right? The difference between guilt and shame and guilt is we do something that we know we shouldn't do and we need to learn a lesson about doing it differently. And shame is we do something that makes us feel bad about ourselves. And I think when we attack someone maliciously, we tend to feel bad about ourselves. Maybe that's the distinction there between those things. All right, let's wrap this up. It's been, this has been a long one, forgive me. So I want you to reframe your thinking about finance and get that finance needs to be completely transparent and your emotional state needs to be completely transparent, right? You wanna have no secrets. And we don't wanna beat people over the head with our secrets. We, if you have a lot of secrets in your relationship and everybody has secrets in their relationship up to a point, and everybody spends time unveiling them when they decide they want greater intimacy because intimacy is about no secrets, completely exposed, naked, and accept each other anyway. So it's not that you're suddenly going to pull off all your clothes and go, here I am. It's more like you're going to pull off your shirt and say, yeah, the, I have a scar here and oh, I'm a little overweight there. And maybe you're going to you know, pull off your pants, but not your underwear and say, yeah, my knees, you know, you don't want to just go reveal everything all at once. You want to take it in pieces with each other, more like strip poker emotionally and um, process each piece as you move through it so that you get to that place of complete vulnerability and have the highest level of intimacy possible. If you have questions, reach out to me, go to my website, richardrelationship.com. You can ask me questions there, or you can ping me on social media and I will answer you. Uh, it may take me 24 hours because I don't pay someone to answer my social media. And so sometimes it takes me a little while to get there. Sometimes I've, I've actually missed things that people have said in the past. I'm working really hard on that. If you were one of them, I apologize to you now. Um, and also, if you like what you're hearing here, subscribe, share it, let other people know about this because we want to impact at least 10,000 marriages in the next 10 years.
that leaves me another 9,999 besides yours. Thank you so much and have an awesome day. Mm -hmm.